again, uh, so now we are going to cover a new topic, and that is optimization. Uh, just a quick uh, note here that we've actually covered uh, some problems that could be formulated as optimization problems already, uh, like classification problems or regression problems. Uh, so that's just one thing for you to know, like a lot of problems could be formulated as an optimization problem and optimization is a pretty cool tool to be um, um, knowledgeable about and be able to use from um, essentially a lot of different fields and data science is uh, certainly one of them. Uh, so we in this notebook, we'll actually work on four problems. Hopefully these four problems will have um, a good range of information for you to know about how to run optimization problems in Julia. Uh, we'll use two specific packages. Uh, the first two problems we're going to work with are going to use convex.jl, and then the second uh, two problems are going to use uh, jump.jl. Uh, just one other thing before we get started. Actually, jump.jl is probably one of the packages that has like for me very good documentation like i really like how there's a lot of examples in that package um github repo and there's actually a jump ex examples or something like that package that's ready on its own that has a lot of examples so i do recommend that if you actually uh want to do more optimization there's a lot of resources online uh, specifically for optimization julia but Let's go ahead and get started with these four problems we have here. All right, so the first problem is an optimization problem on portfolio investment. So I just ran this and I'm running it again. Uh, okay, so portfolio investment, what's going on here is first of all, I'm, lo I'm loading the data and, and we'll see what we'll do with it in a second. Um, this data is actually a stock data on three um, companies, Microsoft, Facebook, and Apple from uh, data points um, separated on a weekly basis. Um, so one thing to note here um, is, so first of all, I'm loading it via the XLSX um, package, but I'm immediately calling data frame on it and I'm adding the splat operator. So if you've seen the data uh, notebook, which was the very first one when we added the spot operator, it just immediately passed the data itself and the header. Uh, so that works out just fine. And so T is a data frame here. And just kind of before we get to the part where we're trying to do any prediction or investment or any kind of that stuff, uh, let's just take a look at these numbers. Like what do they look like? Uh, so when we plot um, the prices over uh, time from Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook, uh, I think this is probably plotting for the first time. Maybe that's why it's taking a little longer. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll move forward and uh, tell you that we actually need to get the prices as a matrix again here because uh, we're going to have to pass them uh, later on as a matrix to the convex.jl package. Uh, so, okay, we have the plot here. Uh, and we can see that, um, yeah, Apple has one of the highest uh, stock prices and uh, Facebook's right under it. And then there's Microsoft here. All right. So now the problem is someone gives you uh, an amount like $1,000 and tells you uh, you can only spend it on investment on these three companies. How are you going to divide uh, these investments? So um, this is this is one way to think about it. There's obviously um, many other ways to think about stock investment. You could just choose to invest on uh, the maximum uh, price. I don't know, your choice. Uh, but one way to think about it is to think about, uh, given the previous history you have about the uh, stock prices of these companies and how much return that they have, uh, this is what you were, you're were you gonna use uh, to make your next return. And we will see that in the optimization problem we're trying to solve here, uh, that we are trying to get a return that is going to be more than 2%. Two per, two I think that's the number we will set later. So one way to actually estimate or get the return value from previous uh, prices is by uh, just multiplying or sorry, subtracting. Uh, so say here we're taking um, the second row up till the last row, and then we're taking the first row up till the last row minus one here. So subtracting every consecutive uh, prices and dividing them by the original price. So M2 uh, dot minus M1. So it's just subtracting uh, time point two minus time point one and then dividing by time point one. And that will uh, give you an idea on what the return on that stock price would have been at that point in time.
Another piece of information that we will need here is uh, the covariance matrix of R, and that's going to be the risk matrix. Uh, I'm going to skip over the details of why is this a covariance matrix and why do we need a risk matrix. And I'm just going to refer you to some of the content I read here or I wrote here and some of the content I also read here on this uh, link. It's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory if you want to go to this link. Uh, but uh, due to just saving some time, I'm just going to refer you to uh, these two things. All right, so for now, I'm just going to take the risk matrix to be the covariance matrix of R. And um, actually, just piece, one piece of information is that this risk matrix is positive net definite. Um, the reason I mentioned that it's positive definite is that later we're going to pass it to a function. Um, and you will see that this function will need to be um, uh, quad form and it will need to request a positive definite matrix. But so this is just like if you run the same function on a non positive definite matrix, it's going to complain. But it is by definition or by structure, it's going to be positive definite. Uh, so this is fine. All right, so another thing we're going to need is getting the mean values of uh, these return um, stock prices. So for each stock prices, what is the return? Um, uh, what is the mean of these return values? So just getting in here. Now, this is the problem we're trying to solve. The problem we're trying to solve is to minimize the risk. The risk is going to be, so say x is the vector of three elements where we're trying to spend a percentage of our money on uh, the first stock. Uh, percentage on the second and then percentage on the third, um, the actual risk is x transpose times uh, risk matrix times x. Again, uh, the reason why that is, is again, I'll, I'll refer you to the content I had above. And the constraints will be a few things. So first of all, sum of x is equal to one. That means that um, I'm just coming up with a percentages set of percentages here. Uh, so the numbers are going to sum to one that way. If I have like $100, that's just, I'm going to multiply by 100. If I have 500, I'm just going to multiply by 500 and so on. Uh, the return, I want it to be um, more than or equal to 2%. So that's, um, that's why I computed the R vector, which is the mean. And then I also want every element in X to be bigger than zero. I don't want to there's no, it doesn't make sense to invest negative uh, 0.1, right? So uh, all the numbers have to be have to be bigger than zero. And so this is how you want to set it up with the convex.jl package. First of all, x is the uh, variable you're looking for, and it's going to be a factor of length 3, and that's just the same length as this vector r. You could have called it another, um, yeah, it, it you could have uh, decided that it's three based on other things. But anyway, so um, R is the return vector and X is going to have the same uh, length. And then what you're minimizing here is the X transpose times SX or risk matrix times X. Uh, so that's how like you actually, that's the actual equation. And the uh, constraints you have here are just, we're just encoding all the constraints we had here over here. So sum of x is equal to 1, and the transpose times x is bigger than or equal to 0 0.2, and every element in x is bigger than or equal to 0. Now, this looks great and perfect, but it's not. <laughs> so um, one thing you want to know about the convex.jl package is that it actually requests, like, you'll see that because this is a not GCP uh, type, it's not going to be able, uh, it's not going to be solved, actually. So it can run completely fine, uh, except that um, you know, the convex dot, uh, not DCP, which is um, convex.jl requires uh, everything, uh, a problem to be written in a disciplined convex uh, programming format. And if you want to know more about disciplined convex programming, there's a great link here to understand how you can map like X transpose times a times x to what it means from a disciplined convex programming perspective. Uh, and so actually, if you go look at this link, you'll find out that to map from here to a um, disciplined convex programming, all you have to do is use the quad form function. So similar, same thing here, except that we're using the quad form function. Uh, so yeah. And now we can actually solve, and we will find out that um, x, we'll get the value in a second, x, sum of value, exit value. So x is just the optimization variable that uh, we were looking for. This is the return. It is bigger than or equal to 0 0.02 by just a tiny bit. 
And then the value, if I want to uh, invest $1,000, I'm just going to spend $809 on, um, what was the last thing? It was Apple probably. Yeah, Apple. Um, yeah, makes sense, I guess. <laughs> um, and then uh, $63, on, $67 on Microsoft and uh, $122 on Facebook. All right, great. Uh, so next, we are going to go into another problem, and that is image recovery problem. Uh, so here, I'm just using uh, the same image we actually used in the linear algebra um, a notebook. And I'm just going to disrupt this uh, image by adding random pixels for um, random missing pixels. So I'm just going to add 400 uh, random, actually not exactly 400. This is going to sample 400 random numbers between 1 and P. So most likely... They're going to be close to 400 unique uh, IDs, but they could be less. Uh, but anyway, uh, so here I'm missing, I'm deciding that these are the missing IDs and I'm setting them to be 0, 0, 0. So as you can see, you can see like green dots all over. I can actually increase this to be 800 and we'll see it even more, except that the problem will become harder and the more we increase it. Yeah, so here I have even more and more. Um, let me just push it to an extreme. All right, 2,400. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of dots here that are black. All right, so yeah, Y is going to be the float 64. So now we're just going to convert it back to actual numbers. Um, so that's how we're going to convert it. And um, so one quick way to uh, run or kind of um, solve this problem of finding the pixels that are missing is um, uh, a method developed by Candace and Tao, uh, and that is uh, that method uh, tries to minimize the nuclear norm of uh, this new uh, matrix we're trying to find that is X. Uh, so here, um, the correct IDs, we know that the correct IDs are the ones that are not zero because the ones that are zero are the ones we decided to set to be zero. And X is going to be the matrix we're trying to find, and it's going to be a variable of the same size as y. Uh, so what we're trying to minimize here is the nuclear norm of x. Uh, y is the nuclear norm. That's that's just the method itself. So let's ignore why it's the nuclear norm. And if you really want to read about it, I would recommend uh, looking up these uh, names and looking up nuclear norm uh, image reconstruction or something like that. Um, but this is one of the most common ways to do it. And then one of the constraints, or the only constraint you actually have here, is that you want the correct IDs, which we already found here, um, that weren't equal to zero, to be exactly equal to the values of the correct IDs in Y. Uh, so we do have some values in X that we're saying, please do not touch these. Find the rest, given that um, these are going to be the same. Like, we're not going to touch these. And the problem is just pretty straightforward. We've just decided on it and we've added the constraints. Here we're adding constraints in a different um, way than we saw earlier. And we are ready to construct the problem and solve the problem. So let's see, actually, so the first problem I had here had much less, uh, it was 400 and now I have 2,400 missing pixels. So let's see if, if it actually will figure this out. It's gonna be interesting. So in the first problem, when I had just 400 uh, missing points, look at this. Like, it got exactly, almost exactly uh, the same uh, problem. Uh, so that was kind of pretty impressive. Uh, so but now we're going to look at see how using 2,400 missing pixels uh, will change things. Uh, also, I mean, the, the norm difference here was not actually zero, but the figure itself looked like it's almost exactly the same figure. Uh, so that's that's a good thing to note. All right, so this is obviously a harder problem to solve. Uh, so still running. Um, let's see, let's actually keep going, moving forward, and then we'll come back and see if uh, this problem finished solving. All right, so the next problem we're gonna work on is a diet problem. Uh, and now we're actually going to move on to the jump to, jump to jail package. And the diet problem is a very common optimization problem uh, used in classes or like if you look up uh, Girl B, it's like I think one of their most popular um, 
problems to test we're all beyond. Um, in this problem, what you have is a set of um, um, foods where you have, for each food you have, um, so here are the foods actually. Um, for each set of foods, you actually have um, the cost. So here is the cost matrix or vector. Uh, so each of these elements have those costs for them. And then you also have a set of calories, uh, protein, fat, sodium uh, for each of the um, for each of the foods you have. So the way it works in jump.jl, uh, you have so here, if you have a matrix, uh, you're like populating the matrix by rows and columns. Uh, the rows are indexed here by calories, protein, fat, and sodium. And the columns are indexed by min and max. So this is the jump.containers.dense um, axis array. Uh, so what you want to notice here is that if I do category, category data of calories max, I'm going to get 2,200. So uh, calories is the first thing. And min max, max is the second thing. Uh, so we're going to get category uh, data of um, calories max 2,200. Fat, min, so where's fat? Fat is the third thing here, and min is the first thing. So third, first, that's zero, that's zero. So that's just an easy way to access rows and columns instead of um, numbers using just their min, max, or like calories, min, max. So these are, as you may have guessed already, these are actually what we are going to use for um, the minimum and maximum intake of each of these things, whether they're calories, protein, fat, and sodium. And same thing we are populating here for each of the uh, foods. So uh, this is the matrix of um, calories, protein, fat, and sodium. Here, instead of rewriting uh, the row IDs, I'm just copying foods over here. And uh, the cost is another, um, is another vector here that's also, again, uh, indexed by foods. So foods is the index here. So here's all of the data. We've just covered it. And that function actually just finished running. So let's see what things are going to look like here. I'm curious to compare 400 to 2400. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. So it did get almost the same exact thing, except that the norm difference is a little higher here. But again, if you're working with images, what we care about is the image looking the same. Uh, so that's fine. Well, that's cool. All right, so moving on from that um, nuclear norm minimization problem, we're going to work on the diet problem, which we've already introduced uh, most of its um, um, content, basically. Uh, so these are the uh, foods or the calories, protein, fat, sodium uh, that we care about, the minimums and maximum. And uh, we are just going to make sure that these are correct. They're still correct. And here are the foods that we care about. And... Um, yeah, so, so far we've already described um, these values, what they are, and now we're actually just going to build the model. Uh, so building the model from the jump.jl uh, framework, we are first going to decide on the model itself here. And um, so um, here we're going to decide on the variables and for the variables. So we're just going to use in jump, you have the macro add variables or add objective or add constraint for the model itself. That's the model we've already declared. And now we're like declaring what the variables are. Um, and here, essentially what all of this is saying is that um, what we're declaring is that a variable, we want a variable where um, the nutrition of a certain category that we're uh, interested in is going to be between the minimum and the maximum uh, of the nutrition value of uh, that specific, like if it's uh, protein or if it's calories or so on and so forth should be between the minimum and maximum and then we're saying um, that the buy amount like every element we're buying is um, bigger than or equal to zero doesn't make sense to buy a negative same thing we're adding the objective uh, function here which is minimizing the cost of what we're buying uh, such that the constraint is we're getting enough uh, enough nutrition uh, so we're getting nutrition between uh, the minimum and maximum. We're not um, nutrition deficient. We're not less than the minimum and not um, we're not over uh, getting the nutrition. So it could be um, not beneficial when we do that too. Okay, so these are uh, the constraints and the problem itself. And then finally, just solving the problem is pretty easy. We just have to call jump.optimize uh, bang and that will solve the problem. 
Uh, so let's see how this problem, yeah, so this problem is actually just running, um, um, so it optimized the model, which was already a minimization problem. And there are a few tests that you can run to see if it was like a feasible point. It actually was, the test passed. Um, actually, we can do at show here. Um, yeah, test passed. And yeah, you can see that the objective value was something um, pretty close to this value, which was like solved um, um, separately. And you'll see that that's actually close in. That's, that's the value that's most optimal. Um, I guess I should have mentioned this. I think it's written somewhere in the notebook itself. This is based on, yeah, this is based on this example here, except that the, some of the code has been updated uh, to work on 1.4, Julia 1.4. All right, so moving on just to find out what uh, we can buy, and this is what we should buy. Uh, milk, 6.9 units, 2.5 units of ice cream, that's pretty cool, and hamburger is 0 0.6 units. So now, next time you want to optimize how you're eating, all you have to do is get the cost, minimum and maximum of what you're interested in eating, and you will come up with your own uh, diet uh, for uh, yourself. All right, so the last problem we're going to solve here is based on this other example from Julia Kahn 2018, except that some of the data has actually changed from 2018. Uh, so we're redoing the problem with some more um, updated data. So the problem here is we're asking the question, how many passports, what's the minimum number of passports do you need to be able to travel the world uh, without a visa? And the first thing we do here is uh, actually re-clone uh, or get this um, data set that we um, wanted from this GitHub repo. And the data has actually changed quite, um, or changed a little bit from 2018. Uh, so um, I already have the data, so I'm not going to execute this again. Um, but for now, if you actually get it, if you get get clone and copy the uh, GitHub repo, you will find out and then um, See, you will see this folder, and then you will find out that there's this uh, CSV uh, file over here. So if we actually execute this, we'll see. Yeah, so here you have passports. Um, um, these are the indices of the, um, these are the actual countries, and then countries as well. And then the internal thing is the matrix itself. Uh, so one thing to note here, which actually I just got it from the readme of that GitHub repo, is uh, these are the identifiers. So anything between 7 and 360 is the number of days you can spend in that country uh, without a visa. So if you're going from country 1 to country 2 and uh, you have passport from country 1 um, and then there's a number there, then you don't need a visa as long as you're staying between 7 and 360 days. Uh, visa free, visa on arrival. I'm just assuming visa on arrival and visa free to be you don't really need a visa. Like you can just, you don't have to go through the process of applying for a visa. Uh, so here, what I'm doing is I'm converting this data into like anything that is an integer or anything that is a visa free or anything that is a visa on arrival means that you don't have to go through the process of applying for a visa. So it's a one and then a zero if uh, anything else. So this is how we're setting up the model. So now we have a VF, which has all this information. And now we are going to use, um, again, build up the model via, I mean, you've seen this before. It's, jlpk.optimizer, that's a common way or common optimizer you want to use in the jump package. Uh, there's others. If you have a preferred one, you can, uh, some of them are actually not for free. So uh, that's just one thing to note here. All right, so building up the model, that's building up the model, adding the variables. Uh, these are um, the variables. What we're saying here is that the variable is going to be uh, a binary variable and um, this is the model we have and then um, this is what we care about this is the password of uh, one through um, length of um, center so center is the data itself um, so yeah the length of it is the same uh, as um, SVF yeah all right, so, um, and then the constraint is that you can only go from um, J is equal to like node, like country one through the length of uh, center to essentially um, anything that is more than or equal to one. It means that uh, you can go to these um, countries without a visa because the number, anything bigger than one means that 
it was visa free according to our definition over here and then the objective is just minimizing the sum of passports so this is the va this is the variable we're declaring here uh, we wanted to minimize the sum of variables um, uh, some of um, that vector passport uh, so it's only going to be one if i need a passport from that country uh, so i want to just minimize that given the constraint um, here all right so if i run this um, cell we're all we need um, all what's left is to just solve the problem uh, if you optimize the problem we'll find out that if we actually print the solution we need 21 passports uh, that's kind of a lot. Uh, so <laughs> these are 20 passwords that in 2020, hopefully they will get you anywhere uh, you need to go. Uh, but except that in 2020, you can't travel because of Corona. So, oh, well. Uh, anyway, so at the end of this uh, notebook, I just hope you can uh, run optimization problems or you can see the interfaces of convex.jl and jump.jl and be able to set up your optimization problem in their corresponding frameworks and be able to solve uh, your optimization problem. And that's it for this notebook. See you in the next notebook. Thank you.